So this week in history, we remember something that's as the years go by, seems to go to the point of um, less and less uh, as the date gets further and further away from us in time. It seems that people say time heals all things, and it somewhat takes the edge off of things. But this week, we, uh, we look back at a historical event that happened in our country on 9-11. And we see this, and we remember this incident called the 9-11 incident at the Twin Towers, and we watched in horror in what turned out to be not just an airplane crash, but we see that there's intruders from a different place that attacked our beloved country. And it caused us horror seeing these outside in intruders doing this. And so therefore, we then set our military guard in place, and we even sent, set our personal guard in place against outsiders. And with that, we came together as a nation in the comfort of the perceived unity and safety that we had with fellow patriots. It caused us to come together as patriots against, in our thinking, against the outsiders who have attacked us. And so we see that example. And yet, with such great devastation from outsiders, the Bible describes an even greater threat coming from within by those who have been trusted as real Christians. The Bible says that that's even a greater threat than that coming from the outside. The ones that we thought we could trust are the greatest threat. The term apostasy then means a falling away and a deliberate and permanent abandonment of a faith previously claimed. Therefore, apostates, the ones that do this, are the greatest danger of the church. And we are then, as we see and we saw last week, we're going to look at it again today, we are called to contend or fight against this. How do we do that? What are we supposed to do about this? Because we were told last week, and we will be reading this passage, that we are to contend for the faith. What does that look like? Well, first of all, in this passage today, Jude 4 through 7, it's, it, it gives us four reasons to give you confidence in contending for the Christian faith. While it seems like an intimidating task, this passage today will give you four things to give you confidence in recognizing that you need to contend for the faith and that you can do it and that you can have success in it. And that's what we're learning today. So we're in the book of Jude. As I said, we go through these books of the Bible. We started at the beginning of Jude. We're going to go through the end. And we're today in Jude 4 through 7. So I'm going to start reading that passage, but I am going to be, uh, begin in verse 3 that we worked on last week because it gets us into verse 4. Jude uh, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which is once for all handed down to the saints. Now here we go for this week's passage. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So we see with this, we are in the book of Jude, and Jude is appealing that all Christians contend for this true faith that was coming down through the ages through the word of God, and we are to uh, contend for that against those groups that claim the name Christianity, but they teach about a different God, a different Jesus, and a different gospel. And so we are to watch out for that. And with this, then, we are to contend for the faith that's handed down, which is the Bible, which is the truth of the Bible. Which Jesus are we talking about? Which gospel are we talking about? What the Bible says is that one that was handed down. That's the one that was handed down through the Jews and now to us in the New Testament, which we then share the heritage of that with the Jews. Therefore, what we see, and we've been talking about this, different interpretations come out of the Bible. What can you really believe? Doesn't, aren't there a bunch of uh, different interpretations? These interpretations come from sources outside of the Bible that influence these different interpretations. 
So we see then that the unbiblical teachings of false churches today are a result, and as you look back in the history, and we'll do that here and there, that the unbiblical teachings of the false teachers today are a result of dreams, visions, or ecstatic experiences. Therefore, these organizations have started with their trajectory already tainted by so-called outside things and dreams, visions, and experiences that then cause them to interpret the Bible a different way. That's why they all have different interpretations because they have an outside influence. And as we'll see then that they are, uh, this trajectory takes them away from the true faith as with all, and you gotta get this part, as with all of Satan's lies, they bait people in the hint with a hint of truth. There's always a hint of truth that bait people in. But they add the sinful ingredients that appeal to the flesh. They sprinkle in a few more things, sweeten things up a little bit that will then taint and makes the whole message bad. And that's what happens. And so we talked about last week the false doctrine, which is apostasy. This week we're going to talk about the false teachers, which are the apostates. And this is what Jude is telling us. So we see again that Jude gives us Four reasons to give you confidence in contending for the Christian faith. Confidence, meaning if you have to do it, it's intimidating. First, we see the first uh, reason we have is because we can see that the, the plan of apostates. Jude gives us the plan. He tells us what their plan is. We get the inside scoop of our enemy. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. So this is the first part of the plan. Deceit. They've crept in unnoticed. They used deceit in their plan. They crept in unnoticed, meaning to slip in, sneak in, stealthily. That's what Jude is telling us. Peter warned about this, as we just read earlier, that they would come in. They would sneak in. And these deceivers then are of their father, the father of lies, Satan himself. Started out in Genesis chapter 3, and we see it in, uh, Jesus calling him that, John 8, 44. He's the one that poses as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. Deceit is part of his plan, which is then part of their plan. The second part of the plan is infiltration. They are in the church. So the church has always been persecuted by those outside the church, even murdered. We know that. The church has always been persecuted, even today. That there are brothers and sisters being murdered around from the outside. But those on the inside do the greatest damage. You've got to get this part because you've probably experienced this. Those on the inside do the greatest damage, and that's damage of the soul. Damaging the soul. Spiritual abuse in a so-called church devastates souls. Chasing them away from God. They've been abused by all kinds of different things. And they've left, they've been abused by physical, sexual, and even spiritual abuse. The promise of healing, the promise of prosperity, they've been lied to, and it's caused them to walk and run away from God and think that everything that has to do with God is ridiculous, and Satan laughs. And so, so when you want to go evangelize to people, you're going to deal with people that have, want nothing to do with what you have to say because they've been burned. And maybe people in this room have been burned. That's, we, but we know now that that's a scheme and a scam, and we know it's a danger. Therefore, we'll contend for the faith, understanding this. Jesus warned about this. Oh, and, and, and with this, then, the monster's inside the house. You can board up all the windows and all this. Oh, yeah, they're, they're out there. They're out there. They're out there. And you get everything all tight, and you get locked in, and you realize the monster's in the house with you. That's what we're talking about here. Jesus warned about this with the parable of the wheat and the tares, that Satan would secretly plant his own in the church. Matthew 13, 24, Jesus does this in, in this parable of the wheat and tares. Sometimes their sin is seen as they approach. They're starting to come in, and they talk, say a few things, you know, oh, this guy's a phony. Other times you don't know it for a while. This is what we learned from 1 Timothy 5, 24. Paul is warning Timothy, hey, man, there's some that are really sneaky. Other ones are so obvious they have their stuff all over the front of their shirt. Other ones, you're not going to know. But Jude will continue to give us their description and their destiny throughout his word, uh, throughout his letter. And pastors and elders are to lead this charge for the truth being entrusted to them. 
The pastors and the elders are responsible for keeping the truth that's been entrusted, entrusted to them and not letting it get messed up or tainted by somebody coming in the church. And with this, as, as Paul tells Titus in Titus 1.5, he needs help. He needs elders. He needs a plurality of men to step up with this. And that's what we're crying out for the church. It's hard in, the, in society. The word men is really a bad word. And in the church, it's even hard. This is why we need the men. The pastor needs help of a plurality of elders and as, as other men leaders to help. So therefore, we see the plan of the apostates is to deceitfully infiltrate the truth with falsehood to cause Christians to stray into spiritual devastation where they never want to hear the Bible again. Because, and Satan's laughing. And now we're trying to go out and, and tell them the truth. And they don't want to hear it. That's what we're dealing with. It's a big deal. That's why we have to fight for it. The second plan then is, and what we see is the plan for apostates. So there's a, the plan of apostates that should give us comfort that, okay, we can see what's going on. We can see how they operate. The second one is, this should be encouraging for us. We see the plan for apostates, the half, second half of verse 4. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. They are marked for condemnation. In other words, they are written down in advance. God already knows who they're going to be. We can see already the beginning and the end of the story. That should give us comfort. It's no surprise to God. We're, we get sideswiped by something or blindsided by something, and it kind of freaks us out. But the bottom line is this is already planned by God. To, he allowed it, and it's all under control. He's got this. And that's something that should be encouraging for us. They were written down in advance in both doing these things and being punished for them. And as we read earlier, Peter told us about that in second in first Peter, I'm sorry, second Peter chapter two that we just read. And we see this, Jesus was talking about Judas Iscariot. You heard of that apostate guy. And in Matthew 26, 24, that he was marked out, written down that Judas would betray Jesus. It was already part of the plan. It was, Jesus wasn't blindsided by this. It was part of the plan, and at the same time, Judas is responsible, woe to him. Woe to that man, Jesus said, and that's the plan for apostates. We know that God planned it to happen. He already wrote it down. We already see that it's going to happen, and we see what's going to happen. So we don't have to be intimidated by that. We can see the end of the story. And then we see the person of the apostate, Verse uh, this, the last part of verse 4, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. We've heard all kinds of adjectives describing Jesus, but here it's master and Lord, both of them hitting you real hard with who's in charge. They've denied Jesus as master and Lord. So the ungodly meaning anti-God, basically anti-Christ. They hate God. They have no fear of God or reverence for God. They're licentious. It says, They've turned the grace of God into licentiousness. And that licentiousness is a lack of self-constraint, which involves conduct that is already out of bounds socially and especially biblically. They just they have no constraint. They just go do it. They think this way. They think it's okay. They convince you that it's okay because supposedly you'll get forgiven anyways. So don't worry about it. And it's basically self-abandonment and this almost always refers to sexual sin throughout the bible mark 7 22 romans 13 13 just as a start all through the bible this word licentious means sexual sin sexual immorality is the key factor in the life of an apostate you'll always see some kind of twisted and which we're going to talk about this more later we call we call it today gender confusion but it's really uh, gender condemnation, the twisting of gender-related or sexual-related issues out of bounds completely, and it's beyond confusion. It's called condemnation. And we see that even in this passage that Judas on in verse 8, 16, 18, and 23 constantly talks about this. And they're perverting or turning or removing or changing the grace of God to tweak it to meet their own desires. They're planning to sin with the attitude of, well, he'll forgive me later, which is called conspiracy. 
in the criminal system. And then relying on God, don't worry, he's a God of grace, and then encouraging you to do it too. Don't worry, you'll get forgiven if you're really a Christian. This is what he's talking about. We see this in Isaiah 5.20, you know this one. They twist good into evil and evil into good. They twist it. They twist it. Then the other attribute that we see, first of all, they're ungodly, they're licentious, then they deny Christ, which means to refuse to consent to state the obvious truth. They deny, nope, I don't believe who he is. I, I refuse to acknowledge him as Lord and Master. Nope, ain't going to do it. They'll tell, talk about Jesus as all kinds of other things. That, uh, he was just a good teacher, and he's really nice, and he's really loving. And he's, but they refuse to acknowledge that he is Master and Lord. It means to deny them means to disown or disclaim association with someone in thought, words, and deeds. And we see this in Matthew 10, 33. And it means to deny Jesus' person as God. First of all, his ultimate authority is that he's God. But these groups, these apostates, will deny him as God. And we see this. Um, we talked about it last week. We'll talk about it today. We'll probably talk about it next week. The, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is God. They deny him as Master and Lord. We see that today. And there's other people intermingled with all this, that deny him as a holy God who hates evil. They deny Jesus. They might admit that he's uh, God, but then they deny him as a holy God that hates evil. They would rather portray him as a, as a cool guy to hang out with him. He doesn't really care. He, he just loves you anyway. They misportray him. They don't portray him as God. Then they don't even deny him as, as the man who he really is. They don't deny, they, they deny him as the man who he really is. God, Jesus is fully God and fully man. They tweak his image as a man also. Because they, they, these groups will depict him as a God that has no self, or a man who has no self-control, who just mumbles when he talks and does crazy things, foolish things. He's represented by these groups and it's, in, it's out of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement that we see them depicting, depicting a Jesus and, and saying, well, the Holy Spirit made me do this, and since the Holy Spirit makes us Christ-like, then I'm representing Christ to the world by acting foolish. It's misrepresenting, denying Christ for who he is as a man. By portraying him, Jesus never did those things. And causing people to go, what is that? I don't want to follow this Jesus of yours because they misrepresent him. They misrepresent him as God. They misrepresent him as a man. They misrepresent his gospel. They present a different gospel, as the cults do. The Roman Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, they all present a different gospel that supposedly gets you into heaven. They're, they deny the Master and Lord Jesus Christ for his true gospel, that he's God and that he's man and he's a sinless man and he's not a fool. They deny those things. That's what we see. In that, they, are, they deny Christ's authority as master of Lord. Therefore, they deny his word. And they all then put his word under the authority of their prophets. In other words, we, Sesame Creek Bible Church, put this as the highest authority. These other groups put it under the authority of well, what it, their prophet said or what my experience said or what my vision said or my dream said or what this person said. And all of them put this under their authority of their prophets and their own visions and their own things. So we see this then that their teaching may be different from each other, but they will all share the same characteristics and conduct. All of them pointing to what we talked about last week, a Gnostic attitude of being above other people and having the inside scoop. We have the inside scoop. We have the inside scoop. They all have the inside scoop that then tweaks their view and interpretation of the Bible. And they all have this in common. That's encouraging for us. We're not fighting a whole bunch of different, like, well, now it's coming from here, now it's coming. It's all the same enemy. It's the same enemy. It's the same character. It's the same conduct. And it's the same anti-Jesus, anti-Christ attitude. 
So supposedly then through dreams, they possess higher knowledge and higher vision, being able to make their own rules and daring anyone to challenge them. If you challenge them, they're going to get hot. They're going to get hostile. Therefore, regardless of how confusing it may be to sort out all their doctrine, Jesus tells us this, which, like I said, this is to encourage us, to give us uh, confidence in fighting the battle. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruit. Okay, I don't know what this guy just said. I don't know what that guy just said. I don't know the Bible real well. This is all too confusing to contend for the faith. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruit. They're all the same. You'll see that they're all the same. That's encouraging. See, Satan wants to make it seem like there's just so many things going on. No, it's, it's, it's against this Bible, and you see it in their conduct, in those three things. This is why Paul wrote about church leadership qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, so that we could sort through these things and not let these guys get into the church as leaders. That's why it's such a big deal to look at these things. And it's all the same fruit because it's the same enemy behind it is Satan. And therefore, they have a common profile, even if their doctrine's confusing. That's the person of the apostate, ungodly, morally perverted, and they deny the authority of Christ and his word and his gospel. And so they're all the same. Now, past apostates, we see this then. James gives us to encourage us. Past apostate groups that he gives us and their demise. We see that in verse 5. Now, this is what he says. Now, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once and for all, he's telling us, I want to remind you of something, even though I know you already know this, but I want to remind you this because biblical history helps us to deal with today. Do you guys know why they're trying to erase history, uh, true history out of the kids' um, schools? It's because they'll see what's up. They'll see what's up. If you, if you know history, you say, oh, no, I'm not falling for this again. I know what's going on. Well, Jude's going to give us a history lesson. He knows that we know this, but he's just going to remind us of, hey, it's the same thing, okay? Let's look at this. He's giving his readers credit for knowing biblical history, but he wants them to take these things to heart as they deal with the false teachers even now. Biblical history should be an encouragement to all of God's people, seeing, as we will see, God as Savior and Destroyer should give you encouragement. When you see he's the savior for his people, and yet he's the destroyer of his enemies, it should give you encouragement. So for Jude's audience and even us, God's people can be comforted with their salvation, and they can be comforted with the destruction of the enemy. We can look ahead and be relieved and see what's going on there. And since we are his, he's got our backs. It will hurt but he's got our backs, but it will hurt, but he's got our backs. That's what we have. We're all, if we're God's children, it'll be okay. And, and he writes all these things as a warning to the apostates, say, hey, you better watch it, because God does not fool around. So if you're sitting in here right now, is what Jude is saying, and I'm repeating what Jude says, and you think you could come in here and do and start problems, Jude is saying, it ain't going to happen. We're going to be paying attention to that, and we're not going to allow it, because we're going to go by what the Bible says. He then gives three examples of these past apostate groups and their demise. Because you're going to see it's all the same. Totally different groups, but you're going to see. He encourages us. First, we're going to look at the past apostate group of the Israelites. This is what he gives us. Verse 5, second half. That the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, who's that? The Israelites. Subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Wow, in the same sense, he saved people, but then he destroyed people, the ones that didn't believe. Oh, okay. So the Israelites had seen all of God's miracles, way more than we've seen. Way more than we've seen. He saw them, first of all, destroy all the firstborn babies in Egypt. They saw that miraculously, all of a sudden, coincidentally, if there is such a thing. They saw it happen. They saw him save approximately 2 million people out of Egypt in one night. They saw this. They walked. They were part of this. They saw him, I don't know, part the little, the little brook. No, the Red Sea. They saw him part the Red Sea. And they saw that it was for their salvation, and he took them through. And he saw that it was to destroy the enemy. He saw 
the, part the Red Sea to save his people. He saw him bring this Red Sea back to destroy the enemies. They saw this. They saw him then providing daily bread in the wilderness for them. They saw that it says here in, in, in Exodus that they never, their shoes and their clothes never wore out for almost 40 years. They saw, now how, how many here would uh, believe that? That's pretty much of a miracle here when everybody goes shopping here all the time for new clothes. But, but these people didn't need to go shopping for 40 years. The shoes lasted them, even. Yet, they still did not believe. And the main example of this was when he was ready to lead them in the promised land. He set the spies out, and, and they came back, and, they, and, and most of them said, it's really scary. But Caleb and Joshua, who actually trusted God, said, yeah, it looks pretty scary, but we can take him. Why? Because he's telling us to do it, so let's go. And they said, oh, no, we're scared. We're going to believe these other guys, and we ain't going. God says, okay. So they, total unbelief, they rejected God's blessing of the promised land, and what happened to them? They died in the wilderness over a 40-year period of time until the new generation came along. This is all in Exodus 7, 14 and beyond. Therefore, these apostates, being initially saved from the bondage in Egypt, they were saved from the bondage of Egypt, yet they were then destroyed by the hands of God in the wilderness. We see this also in Hebrews 3.16 if you want to read it. Only the new generation that believed got to go in to the promised land, which included Joshua and Caleb who led them. And Jesus refers to this unbelief as blasphemy. It's the unpardonable sin, Matthew 12, 31. These are the ones that saw the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus. They saw the miracles, and they still didn't believe. It's called the unpardonable sin. And if you don't believe, it means you're, dead, you're, you're done. You're toast. You're destroyed, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And it's called hell. This is what he, we talked about here. Now, this passage here, Hebrews 6, describes this. And we've, we've talked about this in our groups. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. The so-called, it, it is kind of a difficult one. But in, in, as we look at the context of what we're talking about, the author of Hebrews speaks of this same thing also. So it'll help you to understand Jude and Hebrews 6. And we've talked about this passage before. This is what it says. For, the case, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. This Hebrews passage describes what we're talking about here. They saw everything. They participated in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They got to hang out with Christians they got to come to church. They got to, they had, you think the false teachers have access to the Bible? Do you think they've been studying a little bit? They had access to the truth and they still denied it. That's what the passage in Hebrews is talking about. They demon, this demonstrates then the ones that know, have seen, and have tasted the truth, yet they still do not believe. And it's called willful unbelief. And that's still going on with Israel. Paul talks about it, Romans 9 11. But yet, there's still hope for the nation of Israel. Interesting. But that's the example of the apostate Israelites. Then the apostate fallen angels. Whole different group. But let's look at this. Verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The angels who did not keep their own domain. And we know what angels are. They're spiritual beings created by God to minister to him and to his will. And throughout the Bible, we see that they're designed to even minister to us according to God's will. They're also described in the Bible in all kinds of places. Places, First of all, as the Lord of hosts. The word hosts means army. It means normally heavenly hosts. The Lord of the host is Jesus who has his whole army of angels. So we, we see him as angels in the Bible. We also see them as the host. But these particular angels did not keep their own domain. And the word domain in the Greek, you guys understand this, but it's just to clarify a little bit. Domain means one's official activity, rule, office, sphere of influence, or their role or assignment. That's what domain means. 
They did not stay in the boundaries of what they were supposed to be doing. It also means, the same word in the Greek also means that which was designed from the beginning from the authority figure who initiates the activity. In other words, the role that God originally put them in, they decided they didn't like it. And they went out of bounds. That's what this means. But instead, they abandoned their proper abode. And abandon means, then the word in the Greek means to depart from a place with the suggestion of finality to desert the post. To permanently say, I'm out of here. I'm not going along with this anymore. That's the word abandon. From their proper abode is the place related to them and their role, their dwelling, their habitation. Therefore, the angels were in a highly exalted place of authority, and they chose to step out of that. And what did they do? They fell flat on their face, but they stepped out. And that's what happens when you step out of your role. You will fall flat on your face. They deliberately fell to a lower position. And we see this in Isaiah uh, 14, 12. You can look at it, or Revelation 12. It was the rebellion that occurred against God, where a third of the angels being led by Satan rebelled against God and rebelled against and fought against the other two-thirds of the angels. And this is uh, what we have here now, is that a third then of the angels became demons, including uh, Satan, and the other two-thirds stayed as holy angels. So like I said, Isaiah 14 talks about it. And Revelation 12, Satan and these angels refuse to stay in God's ordained role. And just like the Israelites, except for even more, these apostate angels saw God's goodness. They saw his power. They, they watched him create the world. They saw all these things happen, and yet they acted in unbelief, saying, I'm not going along with this. I don't buy it. I'm not afraid of God. That's their attitude. The same thing. But, verse 6, that's the description of them. Here's the demise. He has kept them in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So they are in eternal, these, some of them are in eternal bonds waiting to be judged. They're, they're in the holding tank. They can't get out of jail. They can't bail out. But they're awaiting the trial where it's going to get worse. And under darkness is not just darkness, but the word is gloom. It's not like, oh, somebody turned off the lights. No, it's gloom. It's the same thing as, as the outer darkness of hell. Terrifying. I mean, kids, kids are afraid of the dark, not necessarily because it's a change of, of lightness. It's because what can be there that's scary. That's what the darkness means. Terrifying. Scary. They're there. And some then are in this place, uh, as Jude is telling us, for unexplained sin that's beyond that of the original rebellion. Because if it was an original rebellion, then all the third of them would be there. But we know that a lot of them are out. But there's some that had unexplained sin that we don't quite understand. Now, the sin is unexplained, but yet verse 7 kind of alludes to something like that. And I'm going to read it real quick, verse 7, and then get back to this. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, that means angels, indulged in gross immorality, and when after strange flesh, they are an example of this also. So what we're going to see here then is that the word like, the angels did the same thing or like those of, the, of, of, the, of those in sodomy. And what we see as we understand what went on in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the sin of homosexuality. So they like those that went out of their domain to go with uh, men instead of women, the angels went out of their domain into a place that they shouldn't have been either. And so it could mean that the angels were involved in sexual sin or just like the sin of leaving their designated domain for something outside, which seems to fit better because we know that angels are spiritual and people are physical. And so we can understand that and see God's order that it's true that demons can, can possess humans and even swine bodies, but the sexual part doesn't necessarily fit in biblically. So it appears as in the same way they went out of their lane and they went into another realm that they shouldn't have been. Therefore, it seems that their manner of sin, the angel seems to be out of stepping out of the bonds of God's intention of roles for them, and they did something really bad, a certain group of them. 
And we'll see then that this is a huge trait of the apostates in their rebellion against God's roles as defined by his word. We're going to see that apostates always flip things around and say, oh, you could be in this role even though God says you can't. Over and over and over, we're going to see this. With this, the Bible then explains these the three scenarios for these demons that will be in this place called the abyss. It's a temporary holding tank, so I'll take a side note to explain that. The abyss is considered a miserable place of darkness and torment, and it is even feared by the demons. They were scared to death. Like, don't send us there yet. We don't want to go there. And if you think about how nasty demons are, and that yet they're afraid to go there, it's a pretty nasty place. And Matthew 8, 29 talks about it. The demons described in this passage are evidently in this abyss until the day of judgment. And 1 Peter 3 talks about that. Some of those that are in the abyss now, it says in Revelation 9, will be released later to do some nasty things. And at the end, uh, towards the end, Satan will be thrown into this dark abyss for a thousand years, and then he'll be released for a, a time. But eventually, Satan, all the demons, and all the apostates will be thrown in the lake, the lake of fire, which is hell, permanently, Revelation 20.10. So God didn't even spare his own angels. He said, yeah, they started out being little angels. You've heard that before. Little angels usually describe something that's really good. And he's like, no, they even rebelled. And it should be a, a, to us like, whoa, this is scary what's going to happen to them. Because if he even sent the angels into this, what is he going to do with the apostates? Well, they're going to be going to the same place. But until that time comes, Satan and many demons and apostates still wage war in the church. So we can know that we know what's going to happen at the end. We know some of them are there. But we can know that, yes, they're still going to be here, but we're going to win. Then there's the apostate Gentiles. Here we go. Verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, they're exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19 they were practicing homosexuality, and God took them out with fire. It was really bad and really ugly, and that's the example that this is what's going to happen to them. And this region was known for homosexuality, and with this, as all men and mankind knows, even naturally, that this is an abomination to do this. You, you don't even have to have anybody find the scripture for you to know that it's wrong. You, everybody knows this already. But they did it anyway, knowing it was wrong. And now, in case anybody says, well, I don't believe it. Well, it's in Scripture. So you can look it up. Leviticus 18 and Romans 1, 26, but throughout the Bible. But the homosexuality in this place was even so wicked that the guys in town came over to Lot's house. And Lot had been having uh, two that he didn't know were angels, but they actually looked like men, over to help Lot and his family get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the, the, the men of the town came because they wanted to rape these so-called men who were actually angels. And the angels blinded them. And instead of running away scared like the rest of us would do, being blinded all of a sudden, they further pursued and tried to break down the door because they didn't care that they were blind. And they still pursued to rape these, what they thought were men. So this shows the total depravity of man and going outside of God's boundaries even with the proof of immediate destruction, and they still did it anyway. The Israelites saw it. They knew in, in their situation. The angels saw it. They knew, and they did it anyway. And here we see the Gentiles doing the same thing. They knew it was wrong. They experienced the wrath of blindness, but they still pursued their sin, and they serve as an example of what's going to happen to people permanently is what it says. And so this then is only a taste of the wrath to come or apostates. And so this passage, Jude 4 to 7, gives us four reasons to give you confidence then in contending for the faith. It should give you confidence because you understand, you understand their plan. You understand their plan. They're, they're, they want to use lies and they want to get into the church. It's not all the people out there we got to worry about. They, uh, there's a plan for them that God has. He knows what's going on. He has a plan for them. He has a plan to let them do it for a while, and he has a plan for them at the end. It 
So we know who they are. We know what they do. We know their plan. We know God's plan for them. That should comfort us. Uh, we know the, the character or the person of the apostate. They're ungodly, unbelieving, even with proof. They're involved in sexual sin, usually, in one way or another. Sexual sin, even like I said, engenders so-called confusion, meaning, meaning putting a man in a woman's role, even. And we'll see that more of that as it goes on. And the past apostates in their demise, we see what happened with them. We saw how they were. We saw what happened to them. And it's, they, have a, they all have common descriptions. And they all have a common destiny. Easy. We can, while it seems all confusing, it's really easy. So we see that willful unbelief, sexual sin, and leaving designated roles are all key in apostates even today. All the cults and false teachers, all of them exercise rearrangement of God's roles. They, his role of his Bible is supposed to be on top. They put their uh, prophets on top. It's, it's constant twisting of biblical roles. Why did they switch that? It's just a hint of who they are. They have no fear of God and they have no love of God. They all follow this typical combination. Here we go. It starts out and we see about Satan right away. We see Satan not wanting to be an angel, but he wanted to be God. Then he tempts Eve to leave her role according to her dissatisfaction of being just a human, let alone a female human. In other words, he tempted her knowing that she was naturally not really happy with being a human. And when he tempted her that she could be God, she jumped on it. Then, tempting her then to be over her husband as a spiritual leader, which continues today, Genesis 3.16. Then, tempting women today to be over men, according to their natural desire we see from Genesis 3.16. Tempting women to be men, having sex with other women and even sex changes. Tempting men to act like women, wearing their clothes, getting sex changes, and having sex with other men. And tempting sex outside marriage. All this is the temptation of Satan, and he goes through the false teachers tempting the same thing. So we see these marks of apostates today who, who say that they're Christians. I mean, th this is the sexual part. You can see this out of the rolls. The Roman Catholic Church forbidding men to marry women, but then condoning men to have sex with young boys. In the Pentecostal movement, the founder was arrested for having sex with two young men. This was the fruit or the tree that could never bear good fruit, Jesus says. In the same movement, the founder of the Foursquare Church divorced her husband because she supposedly was told to in a, in a dream, and for her then to become a pastor because in her dream it was now okay to divorce her husband, which is out of her role, and then to become a woman pastor, and that's the founder of the Foursquare Church. And then by the continuance of false teachers, Tempting women to be pastors. In the same way Satan tempted Eve. You know, you could be, a, you don't have to just be stuck there as a woman. You can be somebody important. Within this, we see uh, another guy with the, with the charismatic movement, a strong influence for the Vineyard and Calvary Chapel, named Lonnie Frisbee, who came to be known as a, uh, a homosexual who eventually died of AIDS. And he was just recently glorified in the movie The Jesus Revolution. That's the, the foundation of these, these trees that we see. They come out of false teachers, apostates. Not to mention, and you guys already know this, it's the exact obvious one is the gay pride flags on so-called churches and how they support it. You guys already know that. But this is the other thing. You've got to get this part. Those are the obvious ones I gave you. That's Everybody can see that, and everybody here has seen it one way or another. But here's the, those are the obvious ones, but you've got to watch this one, the real sneaky ones. You have to watch the real sneaky ones. They're the ones who portray their doctrine as being totally biblically sound. In other words, you could look on their website, you look at their doctrine statement, and it's like, wow, that's right on. That's the right doctrine. But you got to look at the guys, because some of them don't personally believe it. They don't have the confidence in it, and they don't have the integrity to teach it. So they look really good. But then you get in there and you start asking them, well, your doctor statement says, well, you know, I don't really, I mean, we have that, that's the, that's the doctor statement of, the, uh, of our organization. But I mean, you know, you can see that too. You got to watch those, the sneaky ones. 
basically though, they all have the same descriptions and destinies as the really sneaky ones. And there are the ones that are still even in the real churches and haven't been discovered yet, and it's going to happen. And you see it, and it happens in the best of churches. All of a sudden, something happens, and you see it happen. So with this, then, we as Christians are called to contend for the true Christian faith. The apostates will introduce a variety of false doctrines by presenting false Christs and false gospels, but they will all be easy to identify. Our confidence, then, is that we only have one enemy, and that his schemes are limited. He has many workers, but we know that their destruction and our salvation, and we are on the winning side, and we know the end of the story. And I'm going to read that to you right now. Revelation 22:12 12 says this. Jesus says this. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who testifies to these things, Jesus Yes, I am coming quickly. John says this. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. We should have the confidence to contend for the true Christian faith because the enemy is not that intimidating. We can learn what the Bible says and we can call it out and we can look back and when we go talk to people. I don't want to hear it. I've been burned by the church. I don't believe they told me this. They promised me this. They promised me health, prosperity. They promised me this. They lied. They took advantage of my son. They did all these things. And you know what? We, we know that what we're dealing with and we want to help those people. That's our job. But we need to understand and be armed with what they may have gone through and be patient with them and encouraging to them and give them the truth. Because Satan doesn't want us to do that. That's what we're supposed to do. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, 